Yes, welcome, welcome everybody joining us live right on camera, right on screen. Dr. Mark Lamont Hill, longtime veteran journalist, activist, author, community organizer, <laughs> uh, itinerant journalist, media host, uh, Supporter of Mumia Abu Jamal. Let's get that on the table out the gate. That this being that this is Black August, uh -huh. but Dr. Lamont Hill. First of all, welcome to the show. Uh -huh. But as I was joking, saying earlier, my first question for you out the gate is: How do you handle in your career, your long illustrious career, when you have when you have someone who first complains about not getting any attention for his book and then you graciously invite him on and the interview is some garbage, how, from the perspective of the host, do you handle dealing with that particular challenge? In, 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 we talking about in, a particular interview? I'm trying to remember which one you're talking about. I'm talking about mine. When, when oh. <laughs> you were gracious enough to invite me on recently and I come on there... <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know what the hell happened. Uh, I would love to blame you in the space. Uh, and I'm talking about your show on the Grio, by the way. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. but uh, um, all jokes aside, I was in, in many ways wanting to ask you in terms of your career, how you handle certain things. And that would be one of the ones I would want to ask. But we can come back to that. We well, got Kalanji. I don't want you to think it wasn't, man. It was, it it was, was, it was horrible. It wasn't your you best. Know, I'm the, it wasn't bad. It was solid, yeah. man. You, you, you know what it is, though? Um, and this is a thing that I, I struggle with going across platforms because, you know, I, I'm at Al Jazeera and I do these, you know, mm -hmm. 15 to 30 minute interviews with people. Then I might do my podcast where I could talk to somebody for an hour and a half about their book. Then I got to go on the grill and talk to people for, for three and a half to eight minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and each one invites a different kind of conversation. Then we might do some Uncle Bobby's where we talk for two hours on a topic. And I think because you on your platforms, you have the space to unpack ideas and, and, and be complex and talk to these different audiences. Um, when you got to go back to cable news mode, it's a different it's, it's a different game. And honestly, it's not a fun game. It's not a fun game. I, I think we lose a lot of complexity on, on, on those platforms. I think the value of it is, though, that's who we need to be talking to. Right. Like mm -hmm. like there's a way that I need everyday black folk that watch the Grio to understand the myth of black buying power. You know what I mean? Because the people who watch my other platforms already know. The people who follow me on Twitter already know. The people who who listen to this radio show or, or podcast already know. Uh, it's it, it's it's the it, it's it's a, it's a tough it's a tough it's a tough thing to navigate. That's all I say. Yeah, no, no, right on, right on. Anyway, no, I appreciate you What's, coming in, Kim Kalanji. Welcome, welcome. Let's peace, come on in. Peace, peace. What's good, good morning. Morning. How you feeling? I'm good, brother. I'm good. Been up man, since five a.m. Doing, doing my push-ups and, and reading books and stuff, getting ready for y'all. You do push-ups to read books. <laughs> <laughs> That's the story I'm sticking you, to. You, you you look like you did it well, but next <laughs> time Jared try to tell you that the interview is garbage, man, you ain't got to reel it back in to say that. Man, <laughs> you like, say let him have it. <laughs> just let, let, let him, him have it, man. <laughs> let him be great. <laughs> anyway, man, good to uh, see you on deck. Um, you know, early in the morning on Black Power Media. You know, um, it's been a while. You know, uh, of course, we appreciate your work. And seeing you in these streets is, uh, you know, it's a little different because, like you said, you you know, you, you're used to navigating in different types of water. You know, so, um, you know, it's definitely good to have you uh, come on board and hang out with the uh, the uh, rebels in the uh, neighborhood. I know? love it. I love it. That's what, that's what we're supposed to be. What, 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 what? So there's a lot we could talk about. One of the things I did want to ask you in, in terms of we, let's just, if we can just stay in this journalism lane for a quick second, what has it been like having the kind of career that you've had? I mean, for, for, for those of us, sort of to Kalaji's point, it's, it's been uh, easy for me to sit in some of the spaces I might sit in uh, uh, and make the arguments and the points I would want to make. And I don't have to deal with in any necessarily direct way, both academically, professionally, or in the, in a journalism space, the 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 folks and the the perspectives you had to, mm. but someone who has written with and in support of political prisoners like Mumia, someone who has has been involved with supporting Black August. We were just you know Dream Hampton was just on with Kalanji the other day, and we were talking right. about and well they were talking, and I was thinking about your your presence in her documentary about Malcolm X grassroots movement in Black August. 
this being black, all, you know, you and then being at CNN, being at the Grio, even being at Al Jazeera. How does how does all that? How do you navigate it, all of that? I always begin from the premise that I'm on borrowed time. <laughs> you know, like I, whenever I'm in corporate media, I should say, you know, I, I assume that I'm on borrowed time. That eventually I'm going to say something that gets me fired. And so if you if you begin from that place, then you don't you're not nearly as uh, trepidatious about what you're going to say or what you're going to do, because you already begin from the premise that there's a misalignment between your politics and the politics, the interests, the aims, the agenda uh, of um, of the institution. So. Uh, I started actually as the kind of debate opponent of, of Bill O'Reilly on Fox News back in, oh my God, it's been 18 years, 18, 18 years Man, old. I don't even think I remember that. You were debating Bill O'Reilly. I do. I remember, remember that. that he, oh he, was still, he was still teaching at Temple at the time. Yep. Yep. And uh, Bill O'Reilly used to frown his face up quite often, <laughs> Doctor Hill. Exactly, and y'all, some of y'all, I don't, I don't, I don't know if all of y'all are old enough, but Jared, I know you old enough to remember. Um, <laughs> so, Jared, you're old ass, old enough to remember. <laughs> I'm older than Jared. You talking um, about something? Old I know old. you over there laughing. <laughs> older than me. <laughs> I, I just know his age. That's why I'm saying it. No, no, but I do know. Yeah, I, I just didn't remember that. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, but y'all yeah. don't remember pro wrestling. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, back in the day when it came on Saturdays and the great thing about pro wrestling on Saturday was you got to see your hero. You got to see the Hulk Hogan's, the, the Sergeant Slaughter's later on the ultimate war. You got to see those people come down the aisle and beat the hell out of some unknown tomato can who the crowd didn't care about poor El Conquistador. Every week he'd come down with a mask on, get beat up and leave. Right. The Fox news approach is to watch Bill O'Reilly, Hulk Hogan, you know, Sean Hannity, you know, Ultimate Warrior, whatever, come down and slam whatever liberal, unknown, unnamed liberal, and I'm using liberal intentionally here, whatever unnamed liberal is going to uh, be willing to do it. And everybody's willing to do it because everybody won't be on TV, especially back then before blogs and social media and, all, you know, was exploded and all that kind of stuff. And so their intention for me was to just be a regular recurring person to get defeated from, you know, the guy from Parts Unknown that's going to get beat by the hero. What happened was I, I, I didn't read the script. And so I would come on and debate Bill and I'd win. Um, and part of how you win um, is you don't accept the terms of their argument, which is much easier to do if your argument isn't a centrist liberal position, right? Um, and so we go back and forth. And because Bill doesn't ever think he loses a debate, even when he lost, he kept inviting me back. Hannity stopped inviting me. The other show stopped inviting me, but he kept having me come on. And what happened was, to fast forward, because I know we ain't got that much time, um, this could be an hour on its own. Um, uh, the head of, not, not Rupert Murdoch, but uh, his name is, he's dead now. Um, he's, he's a piece Ailes. of human life. Thank you, Roger Ailes. Right, right, right called down and ended it. He said, I wasn't a good guest. Oh, right? mm. And by good guest, it was like, yo, you're supposed to get hit with the chair. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're supposed to pass out and get, and get counted out for three and you keep fighting back. And so at some point, and Bill and I got along just fine and Bill didn't care, right? Cause he also doesn't believe a lot of that stuff. For him, it's a, it's a, it's a performance for money, right? And, and power. After a while, they, they fired me. And what they used as the excuse was, they said I had radical ties. They were specifically referring to Khalid Muhammad. They were specifically referring to uh, to Asada, and they were specifically referring to Mumia. Um, I had a relationship with Khalid when I was younger, and as a teenager, and as an organizer in, in, in college. Uh, we have very different views on, on some very particular things. Um, but I wrote a piece on him one time, and so they used that. You know, then it was, well, are you willing to uh, denounce Mumia? Are you willing to uh, stop writing about us? No. All right. Well, then I'm out. <laughs> you, oh no, you out. And I got a, a, a email one day saying, "How do you feel about the firing?" And I'm like, "What firing?" 
and and then I looked up, and then the Hollywood Reporter hit me up, and they were like, well, you, you know, there's a fire. What's going on? You got fire? And I was like, shit, I ain't know nothing. And from that moment forward, I understood that while the platform may be less fascist, um, ultimately, there's going to be a misalignment between how I see the world, how I want the world to be, the project that I'm about, and what um, and what they're doing on uh, and, and what they're doing on these platforms. So I, if, when I enter with that expectation, when I enter with that in my brain, I don't get nervous. I don't trip. I say what I got to say. Um, I'll give you one more quick example. When we entered the 2000 election, no, I'm sorry, the old, I'm sorry, I'm getting years mixed up, 2016 election, uh, and everybody had to pick their side. And I said, I'm green. I've been green my whole life. I'm a Green Party member. Um, they said, yeah, but once we get into the general, you got to pick one. I said, I am I'm picking the Green Party candidate because I'm a Green Party member. I went on TV for four months. Now, I have the capacity to offer an analysis of the election, regardless of who I'm personally voting for, or who I'm endorsing. But at that moment, suddenly the political analyst was unqualified to give political analysis because they didn't want Green Party under my name. Right. So, again, this, this space is shrinking, 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 because they don't even they don't want to normalize the idea that you can have an alternative option for an election. And so that's CNN. And I remember being there with Jeff Zucker over the summer uh, and he was like, look, we're going to run this Trump thing out. You know, he's not going to win anyway. Let's just keep, keep Trump, Trump, Trump. Then around October, we got that memo like, yo, this motherfucker might win. Uh, let's turn it up a notch. You know, it's like it's like when a basketball team takes a team light and in the fourth quarter, they say, you know what, let's just start pressing them and we'll win. But you, but now you're down 15 and a couple shots don't go in. And, you, you know, it was one of those moments. And by then I was completely iced out of that part of um, the, the the TV season and the electoral season. And so those are the moments where I'm just like, yo, I don't fit here. I still go on those platforms. Uh, you know, I'm, I don't want people to later on find me on one and be like, you said, no, no, I'm telling you right now, I'm still going to go on them. Um, but I have a, I manage my expectations for them and I try to find alternate spaces, whether it's podcasts, whether it's community media and also international media. That's why I'm on Al Jazeera. I don't have those problems there. Um, that, you know, and, and black media, which I've always been on. I've always been on from, from black men screaming in Brooklyn, New York and BCAT studios to, to, uh, to, to black enterprise, to, uh, to the Grio, to BNC, which wasn't black owned, it was brown owned, but the point was still trying to reach us directly in BET, which isn't black owned. And as y'all know, they just announced today, it still ain't going to be black owned, right? That's contrary to what y'all think, right. not going to be right. the Tyler Perry yeah. network, um, for whatever that would have meant. Um, <laughs> I'm still the BET. So anyway, all I know I'm talking a lot, so I don't want to just keep you happy, but I just want to give you all a sense of, of sort of how I think about media and my place in it, particularly because I think there's a lot of people within the grassroots context that sometimes don't fully know how to read me in that space, or, or I might not be fully legible to them in terms of what I'm trying to do and what I do. I, I respect that because you know, even with us at BPM, every now and then we're interviewing folks who we might not necessarily rock with and people are looking at us like, why are you having them on? And it's like, okay, this is black power media. Um, and we're, we're coming from attempting to be objective from the quote unquote journalistic perspective. But you mentioned uh, BNC uh, and it was black news channel and you talked about firing. I, I, yeah. I, I can't have you on here and not talk about that whole conundrum, you know, Ooh. what, 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 what took place with that? And, <laughs> yeah. you know, because we were confused because folks was like, man, you know, is it black? Is it not black? And I think I saw a tweet from you coming out saying, look, we ain't get paid since whatever, whatever. I like that. He right. must got the same account we had. But anyway, <laughs> right. I was just trying to figure out like, <laughs> like, like, you know, tell us a little something about that and, and where is that currently or does it even exist anymore? It exists because well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what happened, right? So I joined BNC, they called me and they said, Look, we're looking for somebody to host a, 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 a show. We worked out the details. I said, sure. The owner of the Jacksonville Jaguar, Shaq Khan, um billionaire Pakistani brother, uh a person, uh said uh that he was gonna invest in this for a long term project. There's no way to build a cable news network and turn a profit the first year or the second year. So everybody already knew we we're going to operate a loss first year, operate a loss second year, even out third year and start flying fourth, fifth year. A year and a half in, 
his other investments weren't working well. You know, um, he's an engineer by training, I believe. He had some other things. And business wasn't good. And so what's the easiest thing to cut? Black news. Um, the idea behind a black news network for us was we need a space, not a news hour, right? But it's important. Let me, let me actually say that too, though. There are, if you look on all the black networks, Revolt, BET, TV One, uh, we'll, we'll count the open network, even though it's more of an entertainment. We, we'll, we'll say, the, oh, or what you know, um, uh, Aspire. I mean, you add all those networks up, bounce. There's not an hour of news on any of them. Revolt actually had an hour of news. I'm sorry, Revolt did have a news hour eventually. But my point is, you got thousands of hours of programming and none of them telling us what's going on in the world. Not even Democrat talking points telling us what's going on in the world. Not even go uh, go vote, get a COVID shot. I mean, wh whatever you think people should be doing, like there's nothing. We just entertain, entertain, entertain. You have seen more episodes. I'm sorry, you've seen more showings of Baby Boy on BET than you have news. I mean, it's, it's just a fact. And that's not, I'm not dissing BET. I love BET, that's home, but- That movie do does open with a Cress Welsing. That is true. <laughs> that is true. So maybe that counts. <laughs> that, that, that makes it count. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, but it's like TV One, they had Roland Martin. They cut it. You know, Revolt, they, they, they had news. They cut a lot of it. If they, I, don't, I don't know what's left. And so we said, look, we don't, but we don't want a news hour, right? That's not what this is about. This is about saying we need black people in front of the camera, black people behind the camera. We need the divergent political views across the day. Um, we need to talk about technology. We need to talk about health. We can't take one hour and talk about everything in black life with all these platforms going on. So we did it. We were expanding the viewership. I, I'll say I was, you know, my hour did well. A couple of other hours did well. Um, I think we invest in some wrong places. I think we put money in some of the wrong areas. I think we spent too much up front in this thing versus that thing. I mean, there's some managerial stuff I think that we could have conversations about. But at the end of the day, they gave up on us so fast. And that's what happens with every black TV show that is that is public affairs focused, that is news focused, that is documentary focused, that is education focused, is that we say, you know what, we gave it an hour, nobody watched it. Do you know how long it took for people to watch The Daily Show? Now it's the greatest thing ever. but Think about when it first came out with, with Killborn. Think of how long, it took years for the, for people to, to find that audience. But they gave TJ Holmes two months, really six weeks on BET. You know, there's other TJ Holmes stories. But at the top, they gave him six weeks. You know, they, you know, there'll be a special on, on TV One with Roland and they'll, they'll, they'll air it at 6 a.m. and say, nobody watched. Well, you're damn right. You know, so Mark, can I jump in? Because I came in late and I, I want you to finish that point. Because, I, I, But I want to um, on that point, I wanted to ask you, uh, it, you know, again, not not just about the representation, but he, but the content sometimes, too, though, because yeah. a lot like, you know, even on these, you know, the BETs or the, 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 the Indian owned black network, um, what you have is you have maybe one guy like you who's more left than others, but the rest present as sort of straight black news as in, you know, the same thing we can get on CBS or CNN, but they're just put in sort of a friendly black face in front of it, but right. they're not pushing the envelope by having uh, either left or left folks on or another perspective. Um, and obviously I know some of that is, is you know, most of it, if not all of it is because of the capitalist nature of the enterprise. However, um, what would what is, what is even the point of having the BETs and all the rest of it that say they're black, but you have to search hard to find a narrative that's alternative to what they are actually um, that's actually different from even an MSNBC or whatever like that. So, like I said, it to act. I said it to act. Like you know, is it ever going to be a space where you find? kind of the, the the type of alternative news or thinking or analysis that you may want to push on a regular basis or whatever, but you never will, except for the, you know, because your compatriots will look at you like, that's interesting, Mark. Ha, 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 ha. Now let's yeah. get back to more, too. You know, that kind of shit. Right. I mean, the great, like about, the, great, the great thing about bourgeois 
journalism is that often they're so self-absorbed, so solipsistic that they don't even pay attention to what you're doing. So I had on at, eight, at the eight o'clock hour, I mean, I'd have an hour with PLO Lumumba and we just, be, you know, he'd be breaking down the conceptual West and how it's, I mean, you know, we'd have on, we'd have hours on abolition. You know, we covered every political prisoner story from the perspective of prisoners. Um, um, you know, we did an hour with Mumia. You know what I mean? They, they wasn't, it's not because they, uh, they had so much trust in me, although I think they did. It's that they weren't paying attention. Um, and my audience liked it. So the ratings are up, it works. Now it may have gotten in deeper trouble as the sponsors came on and they started, you know, saying, oh, wait a minute, you know, what, what are you doing? What are you doing here? Uh, but your fundamental point is absolutely correct. It is not enough to just have black faces doing the exact same news. If 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 I mean CNN just right now, as I as I they change their lineup and it's gonna be like three or four more black folk. Okay, they're delivering the same news, same talking voice, right? They're the same meetings. That doesn't do that do much. I'm not saying there's no value in that, but there's limited value in that. Um, and the 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 benefit from it in many ways is 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 offset by the drawbacks of it because we begin to uh, in that Gramscian way we kind of begin to kind we consent to the kind of oppressive forces because it's like oh yeah this this is what we need now we got the real media look at that black news. Um, and so what I try to do is not just represent black new, a black news reader, and that's not my gift, right? To read anybody can read news. It's to say how can we interject, how can we intervene in the conversation and bring different guests, different viewpoints, different issues. You know that's why we had international focus. You know, uh, you know we had we had an international di we had a diaspora segment every single day, and when we when we cover stories, we cover them from those perspectives. When I cover Haiti, I'm not talking about. Uh, uh, Haitian, when I'm talking about Haiti, I'm not talking about the gangs and the gang problem. That's not to say I don't address the issue of gang, but I don't frame Haiti as a gang riddled uh, third world nation that can't govern itself, right? Which is the Western narrative, right? We talk about it from, from the perspective of, of, of an anti-imperialist posture. So it, that, that, that goes to even to how you read the news and you can do that subtly, they just don't do it. So being Cito, it ended, it ended quickly. It just, as, as quickly as it came, it was gone. One day we got a note saying uh, our check was gonna be late uh, and I knew that I've been black a long time and I've been in media a long time and I don't worked at a couple HBCUs as well. So, you know, I've had some black institutional memory that told me on Thursday when they said, they told me on Thursday, your check won't come tomorrow, but we'll get it to you soon. That Thursday, I said goodbye to my audience. <laughs> I, said, I, said, I said, and everybody said, we saying goodbye like you leaving. I said, we ain't get no more shows. They said, they just, <laughs> all right, Sorry. 9 a.m. Friday. We regret to inform me. I didn't even finish it. I was already on vacation, man. I already, I already knew. Um, I got my money largely from that check. The point was the workers who didn't. I mean, you, you you got people who lose their job on the 20th. There was one woman who who needed who was getting cancer treatments and suddenly her insurance was going to run out. You know what I mean? And Cobra's expensive, right? So for me, it was like, how can I advocate for the workers? Not the not the anchors. We're going to be fine. Me, Charles Blow, your D12 day. You know, we're going to be fine. I mean, we want our bread too. And they owe me some bread now. But we're going to be fine. It's the people who, who are check to check, the people who are hourly employees, the people who made the thing happen, whose labor was the most exploited and the ones who are most vulnerable when they just pulled the, the rug out from under us right away. Um, uh, Byron Allen eventually bought BNC, which is what the Griot TV is now. So in some ways I got my job back. Uh, I was the only person rehired. That's not a, a, a flex. I'm just saying it just worked out that way. Other people went on to much better things, much different things, cool, equally cool things. But, um, but I'm back there doing the same show. It's a little different. Um, I have a little more space to have longer form content. I have a little more space to engage certain ideas, but uh, at the end of the day, yeah, it, it, BNC to me is not an example that black news can't work. It's an example of what happens when you don't invest in black institutions. You know, it's funny that you said BNC is not an example of black news can't work and initials are BNC black news can't work. So, um, right. so this is my, 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 uh, my Jeff moment. Um, oh, <laughs> real wow. quick, I mean, I'm a message, but I, I, I want to know, like, coming from that that particular angle, you know, you have folks like yourself, and I, and of course, we know your work. We know you work um, extensively around folks like Mumia and Troy Davis, so on and so forth. You know, so we know that you have your finger on the post. You, you know, you have politics, so on and so forth. Um, we have a whole lot of uh, 
you know, black faces in high places. I want to know, like, you know, because I understand that, you know, you traditionally have worked in certain types of arenas. I wanted to know your thoughts on a black independent left media, because I think that um, until we fully establish that type of uh, platform, yeah. it's going to continue to be world news tonight across the board. Yep. And, 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 you know, folks like you will be an anomaly. It's like, okay, cool. You know, you might do this hour of such and such and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, are the people still advancing? And I'm not saying that, you know, you're, you're the guru of media or nothing like that. Or I'm not trying to place all of, you know, all of this on your head. No, but it's a, fair question. it's a fair question. I, I think we need to build that. And not just a single institution, maybe multiple ones, right? But, but we need to invest in them. We need to build them. Uh, I think about what democracy now looks like. And I love democracy now. I love uh, what Amy does uh, over there. And I think, sadly, that institution or that organization covers Black news and Black issues better than almost every Black news outlet we've ever seen. But we got miles to go before we get to where we need to be. So what we need is um, we need a few things. I mean, we need to invest in it and it needs to be a community investment. You know, I, I mean, we need public funds probably, but we need in the same way, people, you know, you turn on PBS and every 15 minutes, they're trying to give you that coffee mug and, and, and get, you, get you to donate, you know, 10, 15, 20 dollars. We got to do that. Um, we, we have to we have to watch it. yo. I mean, I think my biggest frustration and I get all the reasons why people don't watch this stuff, but is that when we build it, people still don't watch. People still don't consume it. People complain about it, not having it. And when we get it, people, we don't invest in it. We don't watch it. We don't consume it. And then the institutions have no investment in, in sustaining it. And so we're getting hit from from every angle with this, right? We, 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 you know, but if we have our own institutions, we don't have a 15 minute clock to, to build up an audience of a million people. So, you know, I'd love for us to pool our money. I'd love for us to develop a, 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 a kind of public media institution. And by public, I mean, we shouldn't be driven by advertiser dollars. We shouldn't be driven by what State Farm wants or by what American Express wants because State Farm and American Express don't want liberation. So we, we have to find other ways to fund it. I mean, I would love for some amazing outside source to, uh, to drop, a, you know, drop, drop a billion dollars in black media. And I think this is the month of black entrepreneurship or black, it's some, it's some black neoliberal month. I know. It's black I know. business month. Is that what it is? I, I know black in Atlanta. Black August is also it's, black it's, business it's month. It's just yeah. black August for me. But, right. That's all it is for me. But I saw on Instagram yeah. that like, it was like Diddy, mm -hmm. Robert Johnson, Tyler Perry, Steve Hart. It was a bunch of people with a whole lot of money going to Atlanta to tell people how to get rich. And they need to stop by Black Power Media because I that's what I'm talking about. Institution that's needed. Look. Um and, and and I think pound for pound, round for round, until we have a uh a an a uh media outlet that is clear about the politics of liberation. I think that the thing that we we're we're all combating is capitalist media. And there's no way that a Diddy or a um, whichever Robert Johnson or whichever, you know, right. is, is going to fund something that is in complete opposition to what they stand for. Right. So so it, it, it's almost like a quagmire. So we, we have to say, OK, boom, to the Mark Lamont Hills, to the Roland Martins. And, and we don't necessarily have to be, as I always say, we'll have to be on the same page, but we have to be in the same book. Because right. we're serious about our people's liberation, we have to uh, we have to stretch this thing out. So while we are, are are absolutely pleased that you keep many of our uh, freedom fighters, revolutionaries, and also victims of state violence and imperialism at the forefront, I'm just trying to figure out uh, how can we collectively. And I'm saying this on air because I think it's necessary. This is not a, a, a behind closed door discussion because oftentimes that doesn't get anywhere. We met with every rapper in the industry. You know what I'm right. saying? So that don't really count. But at the end of the day, what do we do collectively? Because it is it is necessary. I'm going to keep it 100. I'm not a fan of Roland Martin. But, you know, that has nothing to do with our liberation. You understand what I'm saying? I won't let yeah. a mascot or ascot or anything else get in the way of our liberation. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, how do we move from here? I, I think I, it's necessary. 
you know, I, I love Rolo. That's my brother, man. And, and and one of the things that we don't agree politically on lots of stuff, obviously. Um, but one of the things that he he modeled for me uh in the last year, um, last two years has been again, he created a media, he created his own media outlet, he created his own space. Uh and that space he didn't just put himself on it to your point. He added for I me, mean, you get an hour of Greg Carr every 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 week right i mean so so and, and you may not agree with greg carr politically right you know but you know the the, the but he's certainly different than roland politically right you, and and th th my point is you can um and i love greg carr i, I you know that's, that's my big brother but I, my, my point is to say i say that to say um he stopped going to corporate media maybe because he wouldn't let him in anymore but then he stopped going to corporate media and said i'm going to create my own thing and on my terms, I can tell my own stories. I don't have to wait for permission to do something or to go somewhere or to cover something or to include something. I think we have to first do that, right? We have to we have to reimagine what success looks like, because um, uh, we have four hundred thousand dollars on money. That's exactly right. That's what I'm saying. So so um, we have to reimagine what success looks like. Success doesn't mean to me anymore that I'm going to be the anchor of an eight o'clock show on a major white corporate news outlet or a major black corporate news outlet. Success to me doesn't mean that I have five million people watching me. Success might mean that I have a critical mass of people who are helping me organize and teach and learn uh, within this space. So that's the first thing, right? Because if, if we keep measuring the success of our project by capitalist standards, then we're always going to fall short or we're going to be moving in the wrong direction. The next thing I think we need is a kind of, again, we need collective organizing or, or fundraising around this, right? Again, you know, most of us don't have $400,000 to pull our pocket and start our own media outlets. But what we can do is get 400,000 people to donate a dollar, or you know, we can do the math backwards, right? We can get enough people to donate and invest in a black owned media outlet um a black leftist media outlet that allow that gives us space to to think and talk and organize and teach in public i i, I think it's doable um but i think we have to stop using the standards to measure the institutions of, of of corporate media i think we're never going to win at that game uh, i think it's the i think it's the wrong goal let me uh, yeah, come out, I, yeah. you should, yeah. uh so we we're let me try to get you fired right now mark where you going bro trying to get you fired where you I'm, still, worried, I'm good at that i'm just getting this light out my face Oh, okay, okay, okay. I, was, I know you get fired on your own, but let me try to get you yeah, fired. Say, where can't you? Where can't, can't you go? Where can't you go? Still, like, can you talk about? Let's say if you wanted to do a show on you, the Ukraine war from a perspective of Ukraine is part of the reason for the Ukraine war is NATO pushing Ukraine to accept it and and so forth. And sort of you're having another analysis that's not based on sort of Western propaganda. Is that sort of still like, is that off limits? I know obviously Palestine to a degree, um, like you can't, you can, you can still say two state solution, but you can't say that's all Palestinians land. And it's really, a you know, you can frame it within a democratic framework of let folks vote and so forth. But can you give like, so where are some of the spaces that you feel like you really just can't go? Um, you don't got to go into the wise or whatever, like, you know, I mean, yeah, the but, wise I, I, is obvious, but where do you think you can't go? You can't get into the heart of imperialism. Yeah. That, 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 I mean, we can give specific examples, right? Mm -hmm. But if we understand global imperialism as the fundamental problem, if we understand capitalism as a fundamental problem, we, even white supremacy is a fundamental problem. And, and I'm, I'm not using it for you theorists. I don't mean fundamental in the most literal sense, right? I'm not mm -hmm. arguing that those off the, 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 the origin of, our, of, of, of the contradictions here. I would argue capitalism is, right? So I'll, I'll start there. But, but what I'm saying is in terms of our fundamental challenges, the things that we wrestle with, the things we struggle with, the things we face right now in society, we can't ever really get to radical solutions. We can't get to a radical analysis. So I can I can complain I can I can complain about what what's happening in Ukraine, of course. That 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 was like kissing a baby, right? Um, but to talk about NATO and to have a critique of NATO of any sort is itself outside the boundaries of what's possible, right? You mentioned two-state solution. Yeah, you can say two-state solution. Um, but you have to begin by stipulating 
very specific things, right? You have to stipulate that Israel has a right to exist, right? That becomes axiomatic. Now, the question to me isn't, does Israel have a, do, does any state have a right to exist? Do state, states don't have rights, right? States don't have a right to exist, you know? Um, but that, and that, but that question, I talk about that in my book, except for Palestine, so we can unpack it uh, at another time. But the, the, the question is, why on corporate media does that have to be asserted and no other state? No one ever asserts Saudi's right to be a Islamic state or, or a monarchy. No one ever asserts the United States' right to exist, right? I mean, even that's a very specific narrative that emerged out of a very particular set of political discourses from the 70s and 80s um, that have persisted until this day. And so the moment you affirm the right to exist, they're not talking about the right of Jewish people to exist or the right of Israelis to exist, i.e. It's not, it's not a claim about individual or human safety. It's a claim about Israel's right to exist as a Jewish state, which by definition makes it an ethnocracy, which by definition is exclusionary. That's the conversation you can't have, right? So yeah, I affirm the right of all Jewish people to exist. I right the right of all people who currently identify as Israeli to exist. That's not in question for me. This isn't about dignity, self-determination, or justice for, for, for Jewish people. They deserve all of it, as everyone does. The question is, does, does, does the Israeli state have the right to promote and codify an ethnocracy, whereby people who are not Jews have, have diminished rights, right? But we can't say that. We can't say apartheid. So that becomes out of bounds because once you start, that's the radical critique, right? Um, I can't talk abolition on TV, right? I can't can't talk abolition on TV, not really, right? I, you get laughed off of TV talking like that, and and the black folk will be the ones laughing. They'll they'll get some they'll get Negroes to tell you, oh, well, I, I get the hood, and we get shot in the ass every two days, and with, without prisons, what would we do? That's not what black people want. You know, and before you know it, you're marginal again. Mm -hmm. And 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 so it's it's I think you're right about the NATO critique in particular. I think you're right about the, the, the Israel Palestine conversation in particular, but more fundamentally, corporate media doesn't allow for radical critique of anything. Oh, right on. So so one area, uh, unless anybody had a follow up particular specific to that, one area sort of that blends some of these topics and 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 uh, this time of the hip hop 50th anniversary and Black August is that I saw you tweet, Mark, at, at one point that that Killer Mike's new album is uh, has fire, reminded bro. you it's fire. You love the album. I love the album. <laughs> Look. It's so, thing, so, 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 but, but just real quick. So, my one little issue. I, I got you one, back Mark on that. No question. I'm not. I'm not judging the album. But one of my issues with 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 all of this is, in all of the 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 the, the, the all jokes aside, the segue that's in my head is, or the parallel is, that I have an issue with the narrative of this 50th anniversary of hip hop. This this general sort of American narrative that it, we've we've overcome we're free hip-hop has paved the way for a new world uh and and one of the problems that i have is that killer mike is both promoted as not only a talented artist but as a political leader but one who has been to my knowledge conspicuously silent for instance on cop city and and several other key issues despite his place so 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 i guess for a question or or, or the jump off point would be how how do we assess both uh whether in terms of killer mike's album and his presence the condition or the state of hip-hop this narrative this this idea of hip-hop and politics uh or 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 even where where all of what all of this says about where we all are in all of this yeah. uh, if any of that makes sense it's the right question um i was thinking about that uh last week and i can't remember why but i remember being profoundly frustrated maybe it was because of the 50th anniversary stuff as you mentioned as i'm thinking about it I remember being profoundly frustrated last week, one with the discourse because it's so disconnected from history. If we think about uh, hip hop as a form of cultural production, as a response to our conditions, as um, as part of African retentions, if we, I mean, there's a million different schools of thought we could pull from, from African center to Marxist to I mean, whatever. It, and don't none of them register hip hop at 50. You know, that's a corporate measure. That's a, that's a very specific, um, framework um, that 
in many ways then loses sight of what's happening in post-industrial urban America, that loses sight of what's happening on the ground in New York, what's happening in Brazil, um, what's happening. It, it, it's, a, it's a narrative that in many ways, unfortunately, silences, uh, you know, brown brothers and sisters, you know, port, you know, particularly Puerto Ricans in New York, um, not just in the 70s, but in the 60s and in the 50s. It also disconnects the, 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 the kind of musical, the musical dimensions of hip hop from, from, from every music tradition, from I mean, we could go to Cab Calloway. We could go to I mean, we 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 could James Brown. We could go to you know again. There's a, there's a million places we could go. And we think about the sample itself as a as a kind of uh, as as a kind of as, as, I don't want to go too too much in the rabbit hole here and get too abstract with it. But but even if you think about the process of, of first of turntablism, but also the practice of sampling, I mean, it just it just goes so much deeper. Than, than, than 1973, right? And it's in conversation with traditions that go much deeper than that. I mean, even just blues traditions, even just what it means to, to, um, to do the kind of signifying tradition of, of picking up on standards or, or the kind of improvisational wit that we see that emerges also during that time or, or that, that, that is demonstrated during that time. But we go back to the continent for that. Anyway, all that to say, um, it serves a very particular aim for hip hop and Timberland and all these other people that have these 50th anniversaries where they can celebrate and sell. Um, at 50, unfortunately, a lot of times, I mean, hip hop is, is like what a lot of, what a lot of people I know at 50 are, um, you know, and as I get very close to 50, I'm feeling it, you know, yo, it, Mark, it, man, don't get jumped. Yeah. I'm just saying, man, it's like that. We were talking that radical. Shit, now we like, get yeah, off I my forgot, lawn. fellas. We, we, we got the young buck in here today. But he said that we all I, I, like looked, it's like, what? It's like, that's true. That's true. But y'all, y'all the exceptions. Y'all here on y'all here on radical media. But oh, most people at fifty is voting is voting for Joe Biden and being pragmatic. Most people at fifty are saying, "Get off my lawn." They like, "Yo, these these kids are stealing my Stupid, shit." Get all the police. Most I just people- said that this morning. I can't front. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm still that guy. Get off my lawn. No, I'm just playing. Look, look get, get off my lawn. I understand it. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, but but um, but but no, nah, it, it's a it's a very interesting thing that to watch. KRS One stand with Eric Adams and talk about him as a hip hop mayor. What is hip hop about Eric Adams? I don't give a fuck what he listened to, right? In terms of the the political ethic of hip hop, in terms of what it means, Eric Adams is a representation. He's not just representation; he is the enforcer of many of the very laws that brought hip hop culture in, 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 into the center of black life in the nineteen seventies and eighties. I mean. How, it, you know, when we, we're playing boom boxes and, and 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 tagging up public property, we are trying to scar public tissue at a moment where we are being excluded from the public sphere, where we're being criminalized, where we're being, uh, you, you know, we're being young black and outside was 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 illegal, and Eric Adams is doing all that. He's he he, he is the militarized police force. He is the man. You know, my president is black. Sounds cute on a rap song, but that black president is still sending bombs. It's still drone in Yemen and Somalia. It's it, it's still exploiting workers. It's still committing war crimes. So what are we talking about? But the difference is there was a moment where not everybody, but damn it, somebody in hip hop, not just an underground rapper, you know, in in North Philly. That's where the best rappers come from, Philly. But we, we used to crush the hilltop. <laughs> He brought up the hilltop hustlers on. He took it back to the old school. He was a guest. That was kind of fresh. I I, I give credit for that one, man. I was just talking. I was just talking That's about- That's the most uh, controversial thing you've said, by the way. All this I stuff about Palestine and political You violate right now. <laughs> but, but seriously though, right? I mean, like the, the radical voice that we're looking for is not, is almost never gonna come out of hip hop. You could, 30 years ago, you couldn't have told me that. 30 years ago, yeah, thir- certainly 35 years ago, I had hoped that there would be something else. Now it's the last place I would look for a radical critique. For a principled right. critique, for an informed critique. I mean, it's and and I'm not making hip hop. Hip hop is no different than anybody else, but that's the point. It should be. It's not a freedom song. Right. And of course, there's exceptions. Of course, there's great artists out there. Of course, there's dope shit happening. You know, 
somebody like No Name, for example, one of my favorite MCs of this generation. She's dope as fuck. I love No Name, but like for every No Name, there's 15 other people that just want to be in the White House. They're just like everybody else. And um, so, so hip hop disappoints me at the same. So, so, and maybe I've managed my expectations because when I listen to Killer Mike, I don't, I'm like, yo, this album is fire and I don't want him to represent me politically. But the same way I feel about every hip hop artist. So I don't want to hold him to a different or higher standard, right? I, 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 you know, I, I thought, uh, you, you know, there's been some great, I'll just say that I won't name them, but there's been some great albums in the last five years. Dude. I just don't want the people representing me. Political I think the only fun. reason he gets held to a different, like people like him, of course, is because they use political rhetoric within their lyrics. And so you yeah. start thinking, and you're right, you should, we, we, you know, shouldn't be naive enough to think, but we still do. Like we all, we get that taste of it and we still keep thinking, is this person serious about about this? It's like, you know, is, is this like a Nina Simone moment? Is this person right. like wrapped up not only in their music and culture, but also in sort of the radical revolutionary moment of the times. Right. So you think that's what you, you, you know, you want to project that that's what you're getting because I think the hope is that these folks reach literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, which you can't reach, right? So you're hoping that they're dropping something and that then they're going to follow up and they're going to be, like you said, like a no name. And the problem with the Killer Mike thing is that, uh, you, you know, like obviously he's a little bit past my prime in terms of what, but when I listen to some of his stuff and I listen about how we need land and he's talking about the, the life in the eighties and how the cops was all on top of us. Um, you get that view of like, oh, this this brother understands he's radical life it. politics. Yeah. And then he don't say nothing on Cop City or he, you know, he's about the- Or, or he says the wrong like thing on, or he says the wrong or, thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the issue, my issue with Mike who I love is, you know, as a brother, is that it's not that he's wrapping himself in the language of politics and isn't political. It's that he's wrapping himself in the language of politics of a very particular type of nationalist politics, a very particular type mm -hmm. um, that part of it, he does live out, which, which is problematic. And in other ways he doesn't, which is problematic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you affirm Governor Kemp, you know, that's problematic. Take Stacey mm -hmm. off the table. Just, just mm -hmm. that in and of itself is troublesome, right? When you don't, challenge policing as an institution yeah that's problematic and i've been in rooms with him like not a lot but what you know one or two rooms where he said yeah i'm a revolutionary like he straight out says it in that room in that private time um you know it and, and you know because he can rap you know rappers and talk and, and stuff like that and and then he'll dash out or whatever do he just got to do but it doesn't get reflected publicly, like you said. Like so, then he jumps back into, "I got a press conference with the mayor. I got a, you know, I got. I'm doing this to publicize something." Right. So yeah, right. And, and not, 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 I talk to Mike, and and the thing is, again, like you said, the music is definitely dope. I respect the fact that he will support uh, grassroots movement. He will support political prisoners, so on and so forth. But I think that one of the things that you know, just being in Atlanta, that I look at is we're in a civil rights town, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. you were raised and groomed by the civil rights movement, it's a different standard, unfortunately, when you yeah. talk about the quote unquote radical revolutionary movement. So the two can be confused, right? Yeah. Because you can have a King, a Joseph Lowry, um, um, uh, Ralph Abernathy, and a lot of these folks who did great things, but Atlanta is not true. Pull a little asterisk on Abernathy, but keep going. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But Atlanta, Atlanta is not traditionally a revolutionary thing. Please, no. When you really look at it, the, the the most powerful things that King is noted for happened outside the city of Atlanta. The only thing that we know of him here right. is his church and his burial. I mean, of course, he did some organizing. When we talk about the Montgomery Boys bus boycott, when you talk about uh, the March on Washington, even his assassination. You don't think of Atlanta as Atlanta being one of the pivotal right. places. No, that's a great point. That's a great Of course, point. this is where he's groomed. But this is a gatekeeper town. I'm clear about that. So when folks like myself, Kamau, and others step on the scene, that's why we're considered, quote, quote unquote, outside agitators. Because here you come, you're talking about shaking the masses. Yeah. Some of the most gangster things that happened in Atlanta probably a rock revolve around the uh, um, uh, Atlanta quote unquote race rebellion back in the early 1900s. But yeah. realistically, this has yeah. been a controlled town. 
And with that Very understanding, nice. you know, to 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 a Mike or a Ti and some of these other folks, Atlanta has a very unique relationship with the artists, with the entertainers, so on and so forth. That's just the way it is. They kind of back the political arena, them and the corporations, and that's why it's it's to a great extent it's difficult for us to crack this egg at times, even though some of them I believe mean well. I you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, I think I think I think sometimes that's the worst thing you can have is a well-meaning person with influence and power that don't know shit or got the or, you know what I mean or got the wrong information in. I mean that that's that's sometimes the most dangerous thing you can have, man. But that's neither here nor there. So listen, just real quick, because I know we gotta we gotta wrap up here. Uh, but I I did want to just give you a quick comment on on you mentioned your your connections and 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 being in the Green Party. What are you thinking about Cornell West and the the the, the campaign and and all of that? Um, that's a that's a great question. Um, I am always. Let me, let me let me let me let me let me take a step back. I'm going to answer that question, but I will take a step back and say, you know, I, I believe that we need alternative options at all times. Um, and I believe that the pressure that have to be applied, that has to be applied, has to happen from the Green Party, has to happen from other third parties and also has to happen. Um, not primarily, but also from folk inside the Democratic Party who are willing to primary Joe Biden and drag him to the left or at least bring that conversation out. I actually don't have an issue with that conversation. I don't think our South Nation is going to come from the Democratic Party. I don't think we can ultimately make the Democratic Party there. But as a tactic, I'm OK with it. I was surprised by Cornell's run. Um, just that I didn't know it was going to happen. That's not a judgment. I just didn't know it was going to happen. Um, the issues that he's raising, I mean, he's some of the stuff we've talked about today, Palestine, NATO, uh, living wages, radical critiques of imperialism. Um, these are things that have to be on the agenda. And so I am um, excited to hear those conversations uh, be brought in public. I also noticed uh, as his campaign has got traction, you're starting to see the hit pieces come from different news outlets. That's not a coincidence, not a conspiracy, but it ain't a coincidence. It's, it's quite simply, that's what they do when you're winning. That's what you do when you're gaining traction. And winning doesn't mean Cornell has to win the nomination. That's never been what we've thought about as, as a Green Party, right? Um, it, it's been about how do we build, not for this election, but how do we build momentum? How do we get a stake in national funds? But more importantly, how do we put agendas, these agenda items on the table so that the American people uh, can, can be thinking about different questions and ask different questions and make different demands of politicians? Ultimately, I think we can defeat the Democratic Party. I know we can. Um, that's a that's a project though and, and and i think we have to be present every election to do it now there are people um who very legitimately say you know fascism is on a ticket right now we shouldn't be having an abstract anti-fascist third party if DeSantis and uh trump are running we can't have um uh cornell we can't have cornell up there if we're losing supreme court seats and more will be at stake, right? If only, I mean, I, there's not a day that goes by that I don't get blamed for endorsing Bill Stein in 2016. There's not a day that goes by that my, my mentions aren't in shambles because somebody tells me that I'm the response. Suddenly I'm the most powerful Negro in the world. You know, um, me, Eddie, Claude, and a few other people because because of our political stances in 2016. And, and, and I think that when you take that position, one, it's unnuanced and unsophisticated. Two, um, it's... Uh, it loses, it, it lets Hillary Clinton off the hook for, for not having a campaign that actually met the needs of people. Um, it's also empirically ridiculous, right? Everybody who voted green wasn't gonna vote for Hillary if, if Jill hadn't been on the ticket. The, part of the reason they were voting green is because they didn't like what was on the ticket. And many of those people, if you look at the data, their second choice was Trump. They wanted, they were like, we don't want Washington anymore. And that was the, the, the wrong choice, I would argue, but my point is Hillary wasn't getting in no way. And it ain't because a few Negroes voted green or a few radicals voted green. It's because the Democratic Party has consistently failed to meet the needs or address the needs and concerns of the people. And until they do that, they're going to continue to lose elections. Um, and so on a West at this moment, I've interviewed him on my show for an hour. And then we did another thing after he announced. Um, and then I think it aired last week as well. You know, Cornel West is bringing those issues to the table. And I, I wish him love in bringing those issues to the table. And I'm going to continue to amplify his voice. 
um, as he does it. Do I have some concern and tension around what it means in November to for Trump to be back in office? Yeah, I ain't gonna lie to you. Um, that's a real concern of mine. And I, but I think that there are tactical things we can do, whether it's vote trading, whether it's strategic balloting. We we cannot afford to let Trump back in office. We cannot afford to have DeSantis back in office, but we also cannot afford to have year after year of empty liberalism, which is doing nothing for, for, for the people. I have a random question for you. Yeah. Um, you know, six, sixers and six. Huh? <laughs> I thought you asked me who's going to win the NBA championship. Oh, no, nah, no, nah, nah. neither one of those. But um, <laughs> what, I, what, I, what I was going to say, though, my, my question, um, you know, a quite simple one is right now, because we talk about folks keep talking about fascism as if fascism hasn't been a part of the American uh, fabric from before, you know, the Constitution was written and when it hit this it hit these shores before that. But my question is, uh, what do you feel? Uh, because we've talk, been talking a whole lot about blackness today, right? What do you feel about uh, the state of the quote unquote black liberation movement? Is there a black liberation movement? And what do you yeah. feel must be done at this stage in the game in regards to um, our people advancing? Ain't, there has never not been a black liberation movement, you know? Um, and I see it. I, I, the one thing I'll tell you is, uh, I know we ain't got that much time. I'll be fast, but don't let the internet fool y'all. I know y'all know this because y'all be on the ground in real life. But the internet, social media will have you thinking the world is one way. And to quote the great Marlo Stanfield, it's the other way. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I'm out here, you know, I mean, we did an MLK symposium at Uncle Bobby's in Philly, my bookstore. Uh, in January, Jared was there. We, we did that with four people. We didn't have no celebrities there. And we didn't, we advertised it in like two weeks, 10 days maybe. And we had hundreds of people, right? Why? because people want political education, because people want to be organized, because people want to be free. The people are always going to be there. We just have to offer them the right stuff, right? We have to, we, we have to create the right space for, for political education. Um, my concern is that, as it always, I guess, is, right, is, is that many of the people who are deemed the leaders of Black liberation movements and Black conscious movements are not the people who have the interests of the people at heart. And what social media will do, what YouTube will do in particular, is take a whole bunch of people. Um, you know, I, I always say social media takes people who should be far apart and brings them close together, right? And it takes people who should be close together and pulls them further apart. You know, you'd be on the couch with your significant other and y'all both be tweeting, you know, somebody, and, you know, and the person you're tweeting is somebody you shouldn't even be talking to somebody in their mom basement in Iowa telling you, you know, why why, why slavery never happened, right? And, and so there's a way that social media will disorganize us and pull us apart and have us led by the wrong people and and create demagogues out of people who don't actually have a liberation project they're just branding um and 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 that's my concern so i'm not a luddite i'm not anti-technology i'm not uh again i'm not trying to be get off my lawn but there's a way that sometimes i feel like we need to get offline and go back to organizing in real life with real people with real bodies with real struggles um in order to get free um, cause then I'm, when I'm in those spaces, I feel like the liberation movement is vibrant. And when I'm online, I think it's vibrant. I just, I just worry about, again, what these spaces are doing. They're so toxic. Um, and I just don't know how we're going to get free in, on, 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 on a platform owned by Elon Musk or, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just, I just, I just don't know. I just don't know how that happens. Know how we get free? Never mind. Let me. I was. I thought I was about to get us. Never mind. Let me. Let me not get us. You gonna fire yourself, man? You about to say yeah, something? I'm gonna get us fired. No, thank <laughs> yeah, you. Do it right here. You too, about to get us our second and third. Yeah, strike. yeah, yeah. I was about. I, I was really about to mess up. Thank you, uh, 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 Doctor Mark Lamont Hill, for coming through this morning. Really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, we have to do this again, and uh, there's a lot more to always talk about. But, but thank you. Appreciate you, my man. Thank you for for for, for coming through. Uh, it's my pleasure, brother. And you got to come back on the griot, man. We're going to give you a redo. He was that bad? Was he that bad? Mark, he was that bad. It right? was horrible. It I'm wasn't, telling you, it was horrible. It was not his best interview I've ever seen, but it wasn't horrible. It just wasn't his bad. He's a, he's a, he's Me, a it was mediocre. Mediocre. Okay. Mediocre. We're going to coach him next time, Mark. We're going to coach him <laughs> next time. It, it, was, it, was like, it was like Michael Jordan and the Wizards. 
Still better than most people. Oh, just- <laughs> what? That's the- <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate I'll take that. I'll take that. that but that's that's funny. <laughs> hey, that was a good one. Anyway, All right. I, I love appreciate you, you man. Take care of yourself, man.